Why is Facebook suddenly keen on letting you take all of your stuff out of Facebook? And will hefty fines really see dodgy MBN retailers change their ways? Vertical Hold is proudly sponsored by CASA Systems, taking Australian technology to the global market. Welcome to Vertical Hold, behind the tech news, where we talk to Australia's leading technology journalist to get the stories behind the news of the week. I'm Adam Turner, and I'm joined, as always, by Alex Kidman, a man who says it's not Christmas until he sees Hans Gruber fall from Nakatomi Plaza. Alex, am I right? Is Die Hard the greatest Christmas movie of all time? Adam, you're not right. For me, Christmas doesn't really start until I hear the immortal line, light the lamp, not the rat. Light the lamp, (laughs) not the rat. You're such a Muppets tragic. I should have seen that coming. All right. So after Muppet Christmas Carol Die Hard could come in like a close second? It'd be, it'd be, it'd be in the neighbourhood of a close second for sure. In the neighbourhood of a close second. All right. I noticed that Telstra put out a list I think in the last week of the top 10 Christmas movies that are streamed on the Telstra TV over the summer. And Die Hard came in at number seven behind Home Alone and Love Actually, but sadly no Muppet Christmas Carol. So I think we need to call for a recount. Um, it's disgraceful. It's just, you, what are you thinking, Australia? Just get with the picture. It's wrong. We're also joined once again this week by longtime friend of the show, Jen Dudley Nicholson, News Corp's National Tech Editor. Jen, welcome back to the show. What's your Christmas movie guilty pleasure? See, I think Gremlins is wickedly overlooked just as a, as a Christmas movie, and I'm glad to see that it did make like Telstra's list, but I, I don't think people necessarily think of it in that way, and it doesn't have the same debate as Die Hard does, which is very disappointing. True. Gremlins managed to creep in there at number eight. I think there'd be a lot of people happy to see Elf in there at number three. I would have liked to see Lethal Weapon in there because for me, Lethal Weapon is technically a Christmas movie as well. Maybe that was at 11th and it didn't quite make the cut. Where's the all-time horror classic Silent Night, Deadly Night? I mean, nothing says Christmas like Santa Claus with an axe. That's the sealed section. So apart from debating the greatest Christmas movies of all time, this week we're looking into the likely effects of Optus copping a $6.4 million fine for its dodgy dealings with MBN consumers, as well as mobile virtual network operators finally picking up on the unlimited data idea and what that might mean for the time on a tradition of slugging you for excess data usage. But first, Facebook is back in the news with a new tool that lets people take their data to other services, which sounds a bit unfacebook like Alex, what's the story here? Why would Facebook want to make it easier for anybody to leave Facebook? Well, Facebook doesn't necessarily want to doesn't necessarily want to make it easier. The reality is is that they're trying to see off US legislation around data portability and potential abuse of its alleged monopoly powers. What alleged. Yeah, alleged. We have to say alleged. Hello to all the lawyers listening out there. Uh, What they've announced so far, they've spoken about data portability a little earlier in the year. They've put out a few white papers. They've kind of said, look, in principle, we support this idea that you should be able to take your social media data with you anywhere. Although clearly they'd love it to all stay within Facebook. Uh, But what they've actually announced this week is a tool to make it easier to export photos off Facebook in the first instance only to Google Photos and in the first instance, only in Ireland. So it's not as though you can jump on your Facebook account straight away, grab all your pictures and throw them onto any service you'd like, at least not yet. So Jen, are you jumping on a plane to Ireland so you can be one of the first to move your photos from Facebook to Google? Oh, look, there's a VPN in my future, maybe. Um, It's it's interesting because I've seen a lot of people actually go through on their threats. Like around the time of Cambridge Analytica last year, Um, We saw a lot of people threaten to leave Facebook but not actually do it. So there was more threats on Facebook than there was actual action. Uh, If you can take your data away, then I think people might actually be tempted to do this. And so I can see why they're just trialling it to start with and and trialling it in Ireland because they were largely based there for um, tax purposes, as I understand it. But it could be a really dangerous move for them. Yes, they'll avoid maybe some legislation if, if Donald Trump is feeling nice that day, but potentially they could lose a lot of their, their angrier users. See, I don't know that it would lose them users to speak of. I think it's 
Facebook painting itself as the nice guy in this conversation. And I think there's an awful lot of evidence that suggests that Facebook is not always the nice guy when it comes to things like political advertising, for example. But they're basically trying to say, look, you can leave anytime you want to. We're making sure that you would never really want to. But hey, we're not locking your data away. We're not making ourselves seem like the bad guy. And as you said, Jen, I, I think there's a, there's an awful lot more kind of saber rattling around this kind of stuff than there is action from people. But I like you, I do know people, including a number of tech journalists who've just gone, no, nah, I'm not doing Facebook anymore. Although some of them are not doing Facebook anymore, but they're still doing Facebook Messenger or Instagram. So they're still sort of doing Facebook anyway. They're still on Facebook telling us they're not on Facebook anymore. I saw that the other day. Um, yeah. Jen, is getting your photos off Facebook enough though? Is there still too many other things that are tying people to Facebook? Well, definitely. I mean, especially if you're a technology journalist, you have to be aware of what's going on. I think that's what has tied hmm. a lot of people to it. But also Facebook is not just Facebook, as you've mentioned, it's also Instagram and it's WhatsApp. And so in order to completely disentangle yourself from this this giant, um, I mean, that, that's very difficult. This data portability thing that, that Facebook is introducing is potentially taking yourself from one tech giant and putting yourself on another tech giant. Like it's moving your photos from Facebook to Google. And I can't say whether that's better or worse, to be honest. Um, it, it's like, yeah, you're, you're moving your groceries from Coles to Woolworths, but you're still shopping with a giant multinational. Um, so whether you're ultimately better as a result of all of this, I don't know. It's, it's, it's out of the frying pan and into an almost identical frying pan that knows your search history in essence. Yeah, you're right. I think with Facebook, though, the other thing, the thing that will essentially keep people and the thing that does keep people there is the people who are already there. I, I, I wonder how much overall value having all that data necessarily is. I like the idea of saying, oh, I probably should grab my photos off Facebook. And I've never uploaded that many photos explicitly and only to Facebook, but I know plenty of people who have. I think the idea of saying, oh, I like the, I like the idea of backing up my photos so that I've got them or so that I can take them somewhere else or store them in a Google Photos account, for example, is fine. I wonder how many people put value in that post they made about that sandwich they had back in 2013, though. That was a good sandwich. To be fair, that was a good sandwich. It was a pretty epic sandwich, it's true. But I think for a lot of people, Facebook, it's not quite as immediate as Twitter, but it may as well be. It's its stuff that you post on a day-to-day -day basis. And outside the arguments you might have with people on Facebook, I don't know how much of it rests with people. Am I alone in this kind of observation? I don't know. Facebook for me is an interesting one. I think people have more actual friendships or people who they know um, that are on Facebook as opposed to you know Twitter where you can follow randoms, for example. I think those sorts of, of things people would actually like to, to preserve perhaps. Um, so how do you download that and you, you make that portable? I'm not sure. And that's probably why people are sticking with Facebook. And also this idea around sort of, you know, invitations and events and, and you know, all of the, the history of events that you've been to and, and things have posted um, people have posted of you and stuff that could all potentially disappear if you disentangled yourself so it's still going to be difficult i don't think that this is the complete answer to portability yet so adam you've spent should we say some time writing about optus broadband over the years and uh, some of their more interesting marketing tactics uh one of their marketing tactics backfired pretty badly on them this week didn't it yeah, it's it's not the first time. Optus has got a track, an appalling track record when it comes to this stuff. The latest thing they got uh, uh, slugged with a fine for was contacting all their Optus mobile customers and saying, your uh, broadband's about to run out, so you need to switch to the NBN. Hey, you should switch to us, which is, as you can imagine, not cool. They've done that in the past to their own broadband customers. They were ringing them up and saying, the MBN's coming in, you're going to lose your phone any day. You better move over to Optus MBN before it's too late. But to actually be, you know, targeting your mobile customers who might have, you know, broadband with Telstra or someone else and trying to get them onto Optus by scaring them into thinking the MBN is coming tomorrow, it's just not cool. And clearly, you know, um, Sim Smash felt the same way because he's hit them with a $6 million fine. And they, Optus claims it was an accident here, right? I suspect if you're Optus, you don't have a choice, though. You've got, you've kind of got to, they, they have made a You do have a choice not to be dodgy jerks about but it, having, though. If having, you get slugged with a $6 this, million dollar fine, you yeah. did something wrong. Yeah, having done this, they're not going to, they, they've, they've admitted wrongdoing, but they're not going to say, we did it 
before and we'll do it again, twirls moustache evilly while laughing or anything. No, they're thinking it, but they're not going to say it out loud. <laughs> they will do it again. If they didn't learn the first time, they'll do it the second time. So, Jen, how do you think this stacks up on the dodgy scale? Look, I, I mean, I've, I've probably sent an email mistakenly to the wrong person before, and, and maybe I've purchased something on eBay mistakenly before when it was really late at night and I wasn't paying attention to my finances. I don't you wanted those ever... caffeinated gummy bears, Jen. We know. We know. <laughs> oh, no. No, that was no mistake. Um, but I, I've never mistakenly you know, sent out a very deliberate marketing message to 138,988 people. Um, I, I think that this whole idea that they can sell it as a mistake is hilarious. But the actual, like, what they were trying to do is not hilarious, and they've definitely got form for this. Like, the ACCC has fined them previously millions of dollars, although not this many millions of dollars. Yeah, this was a bigger fine, yeah. Absolutely, 6.4 bigs. Um, so, I mean, what what they're trying to do is essentially trade on this this fear that people have around the NBN that their their connection, their existing connection, is going to be disconnected, which eventually it will. So it's it's a, a fear based in reality, but they're just trying to speed them up and also encourage them onto Optus's network. In some ways, I can see why they're doing it because obviously there there is that fear there, and also it's becoming a much more hungry marketplace because Telstra no longer has, um, you know, all of the network. All of these these internet providers are, are playing on a an open playing field, um, and they really need to do something to set themselves apart. But maybe you know, putting the fear of no internet into people isn't the way to go. Yeah, it's a once in a generation land grab for the uh, the retailers, and they all realise that. So they will sell their own grandmothers in order to try and pick up some more customers. Like it's a game of musical chairs, and they all want to be in the key spot when the music stops. But it is interesting that the original. Uh, idea that everybody thought was once the MBN comes to your area, once you get the letter that says the MBN is ready to hook up in your area, you've got 18 months to change over before they shut it down. But that's not actually true. And that's what Optus got in trouble for. That 18 month agreement was between MBN and Telstra. So if you're on Telstra infrastructure, they have to give you the 18 months. But Optus doesn't have to follow that. So what they were actually doing about two years ago was giving their customers 30 days until I wrote about it. And then they said, oops, did we say 30? We meant 90. But so they're still only giving their customers a couple of months warning between when the NBN is available and when we're pulling the plug on Optus Cable in your street because they want to shut down that Optus Cable as soon as possible. But don't think because you're on Optus Cable, you still have to get the 18-month window. You you won't. They will boot you as soon as they can. No, no, it's, just, it's so confusing. It's so confusing for people at the end of all of this when they've been told 18 months. I mean, that's, that's if they've read, um, you know, various bits about the NBN. Like, and then to have 30 days or three months, like you, you're not completely sure. Some people say that you should switch while you've still got, you know, six months before the clock runs out. You're given a disconnection date um, on the NBN website. You, there's, it's absolutely easy to see why people are getting confused about this because it's deliberately confusing in some instances. Yeah, and I think this marketing message was, you know, in, in some ways, or appears to have been deliberately confusing, or allegedly de- deliberately confusing. If there are lawyers, listening allegedly, still. do we love that word? That's yeah, our we suit, absolutely that's do. Our word du jour. We absolutely do. But th- I think the practical reality at this point of the NBN build, though, is there will be a reasonable number of people who will be getting to the end of that eight month window. So if you've had that NBN letter some time ago, the clock really is ticking, and you know, excluding those absolute edge, those poor service class zero people, by mid-2021, everyone will be on the NBN, or virtually everyone who wants those kinds of services and fixed line capacity at least, will be on the NBN or should be on the NBN. The, all of those 18-month windows will be done. I mean, Adam and I both switched this year kind of within the first six months of our availability. Adam, I think you were a bit faster off the bat. Oh, I, I went was. really quickly and then paid the price for a couple of months until they got it right. I waited a little bit longer, but not a not an not an extreme length of time. But both of us were in that tail end of NBN build, and you know, obviously also in the privileged position of being on cable. So it's not like we we're on a dreadful ADSL connection to start with. But for a lot of folks, the clock is ticking on this stuff. It's well worth doing your research, working out what is my end date, what are the plans available to me, uh, and indeed, of course, going forward, as we were discussing last week. You may find if you were, you know, one of the lucky ones who won the NBN Fiber Lottery that you've got even faster plans available to you or slightly different priced plans. It's something that's well worth keeping an eye on, even if you are on the NBN, 
But if you are and you get a letter saying, oh, you're going to get disconnected anyway because we're Optus, well, yeah, that's just nonsense. So just in case anyone is tempted to swallow this line from Optus about is an, it's an accident, looking at an ABC article about this this week, it said the ACCC has taken Optus to court five times and issued 29 infringements notices in the past decade. And Sim Smash said the watchdog had concerns, quote, about the company's behaviour. So they got form. <laughs> so what you're saying is fool me once, shame on you. Fool me 29 times. You're probably doing it deliberately. Yeah, I think that's what I'm saying, allegedly. Who hasn't made a mistake 29 times, though? So, Alex, my excess data charges has just been the thing that Australians have feared for decades, whether it was at home and then mobile. It's always that thing hanging over your head, but perhaps no more. Perhaps de- excess data charges are in their death throes. What's, what's going on here? Can we relax? Look, I don't think we can entirely relax based on some research that came out this week, but based on, based on some of the changes that are happening in the industry, I think we're starting to see a, a point where people perhaps aren't going to get slugged with it as badly, at least while at home. Roaming is a very, very different story. So uh, Finder did some research, and with my disclaimer hat on in my prior full-time career, I was the tech and telco editor at Finder, and I still do a fair amount of writing for them. I had nothing to do with this particular survey, however, uh, find it in a survey in which they detailed that Australians could be paying as much as $156 million a year in excess charges with about a quarter of all respondents saying that they uh, would go over their data and and had to pay an excess fee as a result. Something like 16% of Australians didn't know how to check their data usage and about 30%, a further 30% uh, 30 or so, 29%, uh, knew how to check but rarely actually did so. So there's an element there where it's it's sort of on us as consumers to know what the deals we're getting into are and check those details. Of course, some telcos are better than others at making that clear. We get back to that kind of clarity of information and making it clear when you're getting near the end of your excess usage charges. Jane, have you ever been uh, slapped with an excess usage bill? Um. A couple of times. I mean, mainly when I was overseas, um, like way back in the day. Not recently, I've got to say. And uh, I mean, I get I got an excess data usage charge, not from my phone, but from my broadband uh, about a year ago. And um, that's when I discovered that you get three free passes um, from some providers. Where if you call them up, you're allowed to go over your data limit three times and they'll just wipe it from your bill. And given that I discovered this in October last year, I thought it was fantastic. I just basically had carte blanche for the rest of the year. Nice one. It's always worth checking with your provider when you get one of these excess bills, especially if it's a big excess bill, and and checking that A, their actual data counting is correct, but B, whether or not they do have some kind of fair use or long-term customer loyalty program. I wouldn't rely on it, however. But, I mean, the interesting flip side of that, I think, is what's been happening in the mobile data market, both for mobile broadband, which is, I'm guessing, what Jen's getting at, and mobile phone services generally, because we've seen um, Telstra and Vodafone very much go in for this thing of, oh, we have these unlimited plans and people can't see the air quotes I just did there, but you can probably hear it in my voice, uh, because these are unlimited in that you get a data quota and then you get speed shaped, a bit like old school uh, fixed line broadband used to be. But uh, this week, we've actually seen the first virtual operator, the first MVNO, do an unlimited deal, and it's actually unlimited with limits, which is a weird oh sentence to say. Oh, my God, the HLC is going to have a field day with that, aren't they? Haven't they? Aren't they cracking down on unlimited, which is not really unlimited? Well, no, not in this case. So in this case, this is a Maysim, and they've actually covered themselves fairly well on this. It's a promotional deal they're doing with their $40 and above 28-day plans where basically the first three recharges, you have unlimited data, and they have said it is unlimited. There is no limit to the amount of data you can use. But after those three recharges, you then default to a more regular uh, plan allotment. I think the, the cheapest plan that gets it is, is $40 for a 28-day recharge, and you end up with, I think it's 45 gig. Oh, it's, no, it's meant to be 45 gig. It becomes 60 gig at the end of the three recharges. So basically, this is a promotional deal that will run through till effectively around the end of March next year, after which point it's not unlimited at all. So the limits are quite well defined. I, I suspect, I don't know because I'm not the ACCC, I don't engage in Sim Smash. I just write about him. Uh, but I suspect they won't have a, necessarily have a problem with that. 
Hang on, can I just make sure I've got my head around this straight? So these are recharges. They're 28-day prepaid recharges. And the first three times you do that, you've got unlimited data. So you've got 28 days to use as much data as you want. So this is Brewster's Millions, but for mobile data. Am I looking at that the right way? That's pretty much it. The Richard Pryor moustache is <laughs> up to you as to whether or not you buy it or not. It's a, and the I John mean, Candy a, shirt. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a pretty it's a pretty sweet deal on the surface of it. Uh, Amazium operates on Optus, so you'd want to make sure you had reasonable Optus coverage. Um, Jen, am I right in thinking that somebody somewhere is going to latch onto one of these plans and try and download the entire internet? There is always one. And they're normally on Reddit or Whirlpool and all of a sudden they'll come out and they'll roll it up for everybody. And we'll just have to wait until that person emerges. And uh, they've they've happened to have uh, downloaded several terabytes to a phone that is undoubtedly plugged in because that's a lot. Uh, but at least we can be reassured that they've probably ruined their phone while doing that. So do you think there's a lot of demand for this kind of data? Like how, how much of excess data fills, uh, sorry, how much, are uh, excess data charges still a big deal for your average user? Is there only a certain emog- demographic that's really going to feel the pain from this? Are we screaming out for this deal? I think a lot of telcos have actually rejigged their plans this year. So we saw Telstra, um, because they're, they're cutting so many uh, thousands of staff members, they actually simplified a lot of their plans. And in doing that, they, especially for them, introduced quite generous uh, download plans. And, of course, we've seen Vodafone, who already had you know quite a lot of data included with their plans. Optus has rejigged theirs again recently. It's getting to the point now where if you've, uh, you know, you've gone over your limit, then you've done something really amazing in order to do that. Um, like, you know, if you want to download iOS updates or, or Windows updates, you know, via your, your mobile phone, it's probably not quite that generous. Um, but for everyday use, even to the point of downloading apps, um, the, the mobile uh, data allowances are actually quite generous. So, I mean, I think that if you launched an unlimited plan with limits uh, last year, maybe that would have been a bigger deal. The year before that, probably a bigger deal again. This year, I think it's getting to the point where maybe people won't necessarily rush with their, their fistful of cash money um, and put it down on an amazing counter. Yeah, they do actually have some. I've just I've just been checking the details. They do they do actually note that uh, customers cannot use the offer for a home or mobile broadband replacement. Now, I wonder to what level they're doing network snooping to determine whether or not you were doing that. And I guess if you were looking at this and thinking, "Oh, the data, oh, for me," you might want to be a, a bit subtle about how you actually used it and uh, and and you know how much tethering you were doing and that kind of activity. Uh, for that usage, uh, but they'll they'll have to kind of step carefully. Although I'm not entirely sure that I agree about the quantities of data on offer, because the big thing that people I think are killing their mobile broadband or their uh, their mobile data allowances with is video. Uh, I commute quite regularly, and I just see so many people streaming Netflix, streaming YouTube, and they are streaming. They're not downloading the stuff beforehand, and. That can chew through a lot of data, and in a lot of cases, especially if you're doing it on a small mobile phone screen, you can sometimes be downloading a quite high definition file that you're not getting the visual benefit out of because your screen's so small. That's right. I mean, streaming has has become a massive thing. I think that data allowances have gone up with that, though. I mean, maybe if you have a particularly long commute or you have a, a particular reason, maybe a boring job, and that's why you're streaming, uh, you know, so much, so much television, then. I can absolutely see why this would be useful. Um, but there are a lot of plans out there competing with it now too. Oh, absolutely. I guess the other factor here, and this may play into all those people who are paying excess data charges, is there's a lot of research that suggests that people stick with the same plan for ages. They're, it's easier. You just you, If you're on a plan, you just go, right, have my money each month. I don't have to think about paperwork or clicking forms or having my driver's license handy so I can verify that I am who I say I am. Switching, whilst it's not the huge pain it used to be, it is still there's still friction involved. It's still more difficult than not switching. So if you've been sitting on the same plan for a couple of years, you might be on one of those much lower data usage plans. And a bit like, as we were saying with NBN before, it's actually well worth just looking around and seeing, hey, what can I actually get for my money? Because you don't necessarily have to switch networks. You don't even necessarily have to switch providers. But quite often, if you've been sitting on anything that's more than about six to 12 months old, you're going to be able to get more for your money. And if you're hitting excess 
data charges, you're better off getting more for your money than paying those charges. Well, that just about wraps up another episode of Vertical Hold. Thanks to Jen for joining us for the show. Now, Jen, if people want to find you on social media or your writing work online, where can they do that? They can do that at, at Jen Dudley or on any number of useful uh, websites. I'm all across the internet. I have the longest name, so I'm easy to find. We don't have quite have the longest name. We might maybe have the second longest name, and you can catch up with us on Twitter at Vertical Hold AU or via the Vertical Hold Facebook page. And of course, thanks to you, the listener, for tuning in every week. We really appreciate all the great feedback we've got this year. So keep up the good work. Subscribe. Tell your friends to subscribe, and you stay classy, San Diego. Vertical Hold is proudly sponsored by CASA Systems, taking Australian technology to the global market. Was John McClane robbed? And you can say whatever the hell you want, but I'm just making sure that you know what we're talking about before we start. I appreciate that. Because Alex and I can see the list. I'm still waiting for Adam to let me know what I'm meant to be talking about. But <laughs> I'm at his no, partner no. in this whole thing. No, you can't spoil all the surprises. We just work it out, right? Yeah.